Chapter 12 It's been a little over two months since Axel barged in on me at the tattoo parlor. Two months of his constant hovering and throwing his demanding bullshit in my face. I am sick of it. He's been annoying me every single day. Nothing else has happened with Brandon, and the biggest shock of all was getting a call Friday morning telling me that he signed. I am officially a divorced woman. Finally. Maddock and Zeke, or Locke and Coop, if you ask the men, went back to visit Brandon Monday. They came back and said that they had no issues, and Brandon seemed nice enough, agreeing he needed to sign the papers. Agreeing? What a joke. I don't know what they did to push this along, but I am thrilled it is over. Maddox and Beck have become pretty permanent fixtures at D's in my house. Beck is there for obvious reasons, and they all start and end with D, little hussy. Maddox and I have struck up an odd friendship. I can tell he doesn't let people in often, but for some reason he chose to let me past his stoic exterior. For whatever reason, he seems to need the friendship as much as I do. I am starting to learn all his moods, and he can tell right when I need a good calm down. Bottom line, he is a good friend and a wonderful distraction. Plus, having him around as the protector is a perfect excuse for why I don't need Axel around. Greg and I haven't spoken much since his role in the Axel abduction. I miss him, but I can't seem to be in the same room without flipping my shit all over him. He, out of everyone, knew why I was avoiding Axel, but decided to take matters into his own hands. Deep down, I knew he meant well, but I'm not ready to forget how easy he turned on me. Having Maddox around has another plus when it comes to Greg. Maddox doesn't play well with others, even his brothers. If I get upset, Maddox turns into a grizzly. I have been so used to only having D and Greg that it is almost refreshing to have another person I can trust in my life. It is Saturday morning, and November is in full Georgia force, and we have a nice cold rainy day on our hands. I call Maddox to see if he wants to come over and watch some football, drink some beer, and celebrate my newfound singlehood. Dee has already been to the store and bought a cake, streamers, and freaking balloons. I think she might be more excited than I am. I haven't heard from Axel since earlier in the week when he called to let me know he was going to be out of town and to let him know if anything happened. No chance in that. Maddox shows up early in the afternoon with one of his rare smiles in place. Dee lets him in, and he wastes no time coming to congratulate me. Hey, girl. Happy? Leave it to him. All it takes is those three words for me to let the waterworks flow. Oh, my God! I get out between broken sobs. It's over, Mad. Can you believe it? The last eight years of my life are done with just one signature. Freedom. Do you know how long I prayed to be free from Brandon? Yeah, I get you, girl. No more worries. He wraps his strong arms around me and just lets me let it out. Tears of relief, joy, and maybe a whole lot of shock. I don't know how long we just sit there. Words aren't necessary because he just gets it. He knows I need to let this out in order to move on and completely let the pain of my marriage die. After I am done using his shoulder as a tissue, I look up and meet his normal blank face, expecting to find annoyance, but instead get a smirk before he throws his head back and laughs. That is another Maddox moment that doesn't happen often. Girl, you look like a drowned raccoon. All that black shitty chicks he uses all over your face. Go clean up before I'm forced to call animal control to come take your ass. I throw a pillow off the couch in his face before leaving the living room and going to clean myself up. I hear him click the TV on, and the game day broadcast takes over the silence. Walking into the hallway, I almost jump out of my skin when I nearly collide with a damp-faced D. He really is a big softy under that don't-touch-me vibe, isn't he? she asks. Don't let him hear you say that, but yeah, he's been great these last few weeks. I'm so happy this is over. I know I haven't been around much, but you know I'm here if you need me. She looks so guilty, and even though I know she means well, it breaks my heart. Dee, don't you dare feel bad about having a life. I'm good, really. I feel good, and I haven't been alone. Mad's been around, and Coop comes sometimes. Plus, you're here, even if it's holed up in your room shaking the walls with back. I walk away, leaving her red-faced but laughing. Love you, you stupid bitch! She yells after me. The alarm is beeped a few times while I was in the bathroom getting cleaned up, 
signaling that someone has opened and shut the front door a few times. Assuming that it is either Beck or Coop, I just brush it off and continue to get ready. I throw off my yoga pants and tank, switching them out for some worn jeans and my favorite University of Georgia tee. Game day gear, a must for any Georgia fan. My face is clear of all black tracks under my eyes and down my cheeks from my crying fit earlier. I am just pulling up my long hair in a ponytail when a deep voice clears his throat behind me, causing me to jump about a mile out of my body. Baby girl, can we please talk? Not if you plan on dragging me down, Greg. Today is not the day to do this. We're celebrating. Izzy, you know how much it hurt to hear the asshole finally sign from Locke? He's known you a few months, and you tell him first? Every step of the way, Izzy, I've been here for everything, and you didn't even call me? Okay, you want to do this? Fine. I am pissed, Greg. You went behind my back and called him. You not only called him, but you might as well have thrown a fucking bat signal into the air and beamed his ass right into the shop. How could you? How fucking could you? He bows his head and lets out a long sigh. Do you know what it's like to sit back and watch someone you love turn into themselves? You were headed back to that fucked up hole you always push yourself in. Don't think I did that lightly, Izzy. Not for one second. You avoided talking about shit to me and Dee and ran around God's green earth to stay busy enough so you didn't have to deal with the shit in your life. We were worried. Worried about that shit Brandon was pulling, but mostly worried about how you were handling Axel showing back up. Don't think I didn't know the real reason you ran. And you know as well as I do, if I hadn't forced your hand, you would still be running today. It wasn't your decision to make, G. It was mine. And by forcing my hand, you took my control, the one thing I have fought to regain in my life. If that wasn't enough, you forced him on me. I just don't know if I can forget that so easily. I can forgive you because even pissed as hell, I know you wouldn't hurt me, but you knew. You fucking knew how hard that was going to be on me. I wanted that meeting on my terms when I was ready. It's hard to keep eye contact with him because he has started pacing around my room. Surefire sign that Greg is frustrated and worried. I'm sorry. I'm fucking sorry. I don't know what to say other than that. You're my family, and given the chance, I would do it all over again if it were the best move to help you. Axel aside, that shit with Brandon was fucked up, and you needed all the power behind you that you could get if he tried something else. The only thing I regret was upsetting you. I hate fighting with Greg. This is by far the worst, and to be honest, not having him around is hard. He is my rock. Maddox is becoming just as important, but no one can replace what Greg means to me. I get it, I do. It hurts, but I can see where you were coming from. I get up and walk into his open arms. No more fighting, okay? But don't pull that shit again. All right, baby girl. No more fighting. Come on. Kickoff should be soon, and if you make me miss that, you're watching the game somewhere else. Laughing, he follows me out of the room, almost knocking me to the ground when I reach the living room and stop dead in my tracks. What the hell are you doing here? I ask the man relaxing on my couch, feet propped up on the coffee table with a beer in hand. Well, hello to you too, princess. Coop called, said he would be over here watching the game with Locke. Joined along. Didn't think you would mind. Cocky, arrogant asshole. He is just daring me to throw a fit and kick him out. You're a dick, you know that, Axel Reed? Shut up and get your feet off my table. I kick his feet off the table when I walk past, only earning me a deep laugh before he props them right back up. Get them down, asshole. I grumble under my breath as I continue my way into the kitchen to grab the food and a beer. Coop and Maddox are standing around the island when I walk in. I get a small smirk from Maddox before walking over to Coop and smacking him on the side of the head. Ass, you do not invite him here. Maddox gave the boom of laughter before grabbing the tray of taco dip and walking back into the living room. Girl, he probably didn't even feel that with his hard head. Shut up, Mad. I smile at his retreating back before throwing another scowl at Coop. Jerk. I grab the chips and a few beers before walking back in, just in time for kickoff. Dee and Becker cozied up on the love seat against the far wall. Greg and Coop have taken the recliners, leaving Maddox and Axel sitting on the couch with one empty spot between the two of them. You've got to be kidding me. Sit on the floor, asshat. I try to give Axel the mean, hard look Maddox is always sporting, but apparently I lack the conviction. You look like you need to take a shit, princess. I won't bite. 
unless you want me to. His evil, arrogant smirk and that cocky twinkle light his emerald eyes up. I can play this game. I can act like being in the same room with his handsome self isn't ripping me apart. Easy, right? Don't you know? I prefer it hard and rough now, Axel. But you keep your teeth and everything else to yourself. That wipes his face clear. No more look of a male giant ego and arrogant pride. Nope, he wasn't going to get the upper hand on me. D and Beck are too into each other to notice the tension in the room. Greg looks concerned. Coop looks like he might laugh at any moment. And Maddox is just looking at the TV. But I can tell he wants to speak up. I just plop down as close as I can to Maddox without sitting in his lap and ignore Axel as long as I can. The third quarter is just wrapping up when the doorbell rings. I wave off Dee and head off to the door, noticing a little too late how light-headed I am. I have been throwing back beer after beer for the last hour, not eating much because I am still holding on to my snit about Axel being in the house. Walking around the corner of the living room and down the short entryway, I can hear the loud cheers and male grunting signaling another touchdown as I reach the door. This better be good. As I swing open the door, it takes my beer-filled mind a second to register who is standing on my porch. When I do, my first reaction is to shut the door. Serves me right not checking the peephole, but when I go to shut it, I met with the resistance of his foot. Before I can even get a shout or scream past my terrified lips, he reaches in and pulls me outside— closes the door and pushes me back. My back meets the frame of the door hard, causing me to let out a small grunt of pain. He closes his hand around my neck and squeezes, cutting off my air supply and keeping my cries for help from escaping. Hello, Isabel. You think you can get rid of me that easily? Look at what your boyfriend did to my face. His nose has a bandage over the bridge, clearly holding the broken bone together. His eyes are both bruised and blackened, and his lip has a small cut in the corner. If I weren't so scared, I would smile. Finally, Brandon is at a taste of his own medicine. Don't think I don't know who he is either, Isabel. You talked about him enough for me to know exactly who he was when I opened the door. You think you can threaten me? Tell my father and the board about my little extracurricular activities? I don't think so, Isabel. And if you know what's good for you, you will call out the trashy animals sniffing around in my business. You got your papers signed. But hear me, you will always be mine. Call them off. Now. He looks raging mad, so close to my face that the spit from his whispered words hits my face. I have no idea what he is talking about. Answer me, bitch. You'll be telling him to leave me alone, you understand? He forces out, again spraying me with his spit. I claw at his hand, trying to get him to loosen up his hold. I can feel my lungs burning, demanding oxygen. My nails are clawing his hands and wrist, trying desperately to get some air. My lack of being able to breathe must have missed the mark with Brandon, his rage blinding him from his actions. My vision is getting black around the edges, but not before I see him pull his arm back and bring his fist racing forward, meeting my right eye with unbearable pain. My head hits the doorframe, sending another wave of stomach-rolling pain shooting through my head. He releases my neck and throws me down onto the porch, standing over my body with his feet on either side of my stomach. He leans down and whispers in my ear, I will be in touch, Isabel, but you tell those motherfuckers to stop fucking coming around and asking questions. I did what your boyfriend said and signed those papers, but I don't need those fucking papers to prove who you belong to. You fucking hear me, bitch? You're mine. I will fucking kill him if he touches you. Got that? I'll be keeping an eye on you, Isabel. He gets off another punch to my right eye, finally releasing the scream that was trapped moments ago. Then he's gone. The amount of pain my body feels is the only thing keeping me from thinking I just dreamt this whole thing. I can feel them from my position on the porch floor running inside the house. The front door is pulled open and strong hands lift me up. I wince in pain when my back meets a solid arm. What the fuck? Greg, I think, says from somewhere behind me. Oh my God, is he? She's bleeding, oh my God! Dee screeches from the same direction. My vision is blurry. I can only make out that the person holding me is male. If it weren't for the deep scent of leather and cinnamon, I wouldn't have known it is Axel who's holding me so tenderly. Coop, Locke, go fucking find that motherfucker before he gets away. He grates out his tone, lethal. Someone call the goddamn police now! 
Princess, are you hurt anywhere else other than your head? Neck, gasp, back, wheeze. It was Brandon. It was here. I can't make out his expression. My right eye is throbbing and swollen shut. I can't even open my left eye because the movement causes more excruciating pain to blast through my skull like lightning. Belatedly, I feel it must be warm blood running down the back of my neck. The arms holding me go rock hard at the mention of Brandon. Not what he was expecting to hear, but then again, he wasn't exactly planning on football Saturday turning into this mess. Here, hold this, Greg says, placing something over the back of my head. Axel adjusts his hold on me and stands from his crouched position on the porch. I can feel him walking through the house to the living room. I can hear the sounds of people moving around the room. Axel sits down on the couch but doesn't release me. Sit up, princess. Let's take a look at your back, yeah? He helps me lean forward, making my stomach lurch, and I feel warm hands moving up my shirt. Fuck, Greg yells. How the fuck did this happen? You've got welts all the way up your spine is. I don't answer because, really, what's the point? I think it's pretty obvious how I got like this. I can hear the sirens approaching, making me snuggle closer to the safety Axel's strong arms are providing. Just when I think I am finally free. What a joke that was. I'm beginning to think I won't ever be free of Brandon's reach. Dee is directing the police officers and the paramedics into the living room. I can hear Greg off to the side somewhere, talking in low tones with Maddox answering back. I can't tell where anyone else is, and I'm in no hurry to open my eyes and check. Ma'am, a new voice joins the group. Ma'am, can you open your eyes? Axel shifts and moves me away from his warmth placing my body in a way that allows this person to start touching my face. Immediately, I draw back into his body. Shh, Izzy, let them look at you. His warm breath tickles my ear, and his arm tightens around my shoulders, reminding me that he is here and I am safe. His head turns from my ear and he addresses the new voice. I don't think she can open her eyes without pain. She tried a second after I reached her, but they snapped shut quickly. Hasn't opened since. Her breathing sounds raspy, and her voice seemed hoarse when she was able to talk. Hasn't spoken since. Her back has what looks like a welt-like bruise from tailbone to shoulder blades. I haven't been able to take a good look at it. Neck injury and the source of the blood is from the back of her head. Again, I haven't taken a good look. He must be speaking to the paramedic, because when he finishes, I feel soft, gloved hands start pressing into my face, around my neck, and up my throat. Ma'am, I need to lean forward a bit so that I can look over your back and head slowly. And let me know if you feel like you're... He doesn't get a chance to finish before I empty the contents of my stomach all over the floor. Okay, that's okay. Do you feel nauseated? Yes, I answer back again, not recognizing my own voice. I sound like I've spent the last few hours screaming. Did you hit your head? No. Yes, I whisper my reply. I don't remember... I was pushed into the door frame before he grabbed my neck. I don't remember much after that. That's okay. Let me check you out right now, okay? His soft hands spend a few minutes taking my blood pressure before they continue to press and poke around my tender skin, earning a few hisses of pain from me and growls from Axel. They have me lean forward again, moving my hair around to check out the source of the bleeding, and then he checks my back. I can feel the torn skin on my back stretching and pulling tight with every small movement of my body. Sir, I can't be sure without taking her to the hospital, but I'm willing to bet on a concussion. The head wound definitely needs stitches. Her back is troubling, but again, I can't guarantee the damage done is only on the surface. That isn't even counting her facial injuries. I would strongly advise a trip to the hospital. That's fine, but I'll be driving her. I'm not letting her out of my sight. Even I can tell by his tone that there will be no bending on this. The poor guy trying to do his job attempts to explain to him that I would be completely safe riding in the ambulance, but there is no use. Axel and all his stubbornness have spoken, and there will only be one way for me to get to the hospital tonight. Begrudgingly, he stops his protest and asks Axel to sign off that no further treatment by the paramedics is preferred. He gets my head cleaned and applies some gauze to my back, telling Axel that he needs to keep pressure on my head until I get to the hospital. I get a few ice packs and hold one to my right eye and the other to my sore neck. After he has done all he can, the paramedics take their leave. 
I start nodding off shortly after, listening to the voices around me explain the events leading up to my crying out from the porch. I attempt to answer the questions the officers have for me, but my drowsy and confused mind keeps pulling me under. Axel rouses me a few times, and I am able to tell them who attacked me, but after falling asleep again, I faintly hear Axel tell them to meet us at the hospital with any further questions. Despite his calm and strong tone, I can hear a small tremor of fear. He adjusts me in his arms and begins to stand. I don't hear much after he tells someone to get the truck and drive him to the hospital. I let the safety of his strong arms and the comforting scent that only comes with Axel carry me off to the numbing blackness. I wake up to the annoying sound of beeping and the nauseating smell of antiseptic and cleaner. Death. I've always thought the hospital smelled like death. It's a smell you never forget, and one I have always hated. I try to open my eyes, but they don't obey my commands. I try to open my mouth and demand answers, but nothing comes out. It's like my body has decided to play dead. The doctor says there are no internal injuries other than some bruising and a lot of old broken bones badly reset. Home job the best he can tell. I looked at the scans read. It looked like she has had every rib in her body broken at one point. I would gladly kill that motherfucker if I got my hands on him. Coop, I've never heard him sound so pissed. He's usually the fun-loving one of the group. Took ten stitches to close up her head. Nothing too bad, and should be fine. Her neck is swollen. Fucker must have had one hell of a firm grip on her. The biggest concern at this point is her concussion and assessing her vision after she wakes up. The warm hand holding mine flexes and tightens a few times during my grocery list of injuries review. Even with my eyes closed and my mind hazy, I can feel the energy in the room grow heavy. It feels alive, making the hairs on my arms and neck stand on end. He's fucking dead, you hear me? I'll kill that sick fuck myself. Axel releases my hand and I feel it return, pushing the hair back behind my ear. It guts me to know she lived like this for so many years. Knowing this wasn't even close to the worst slices me fucking deep. I know, Reed. Where's D? Greg? Both. Either. I don't care. He must have his head turned because it's hard to make out his question. I'm shocked that D isn't already by my side. Beck made her go get something to eat. Said she wouldn't stop pacing and was shaking something crazy. Last I saw Greg, he was about to pop some hemorrhoids. He was holding it in so tight. You sure there isn't more there? They seem pretty tight. Just friends, he says. Doesn't matter. He isn't touching her. His hand returns to mine, and he brings his lips down for one small kiss to my hand. So tender and unlike the axle I've been dealing with for the last month. I feel you. I'm going to step out and see what Locke found. A few minutes pass. He has his forehead resting on my hip, his lips resting on our joined hands. I can feel his mouth moving, warm breath caressing my skin, but I can't make out his whispered words. Izzy, please wake up. Please, please, princess. I don't know what shocks me more, his gentle pleading or the single warm tear that hits my hand. I don't know how long we pass time just like that. A few of the others come and go, asking Axel some questions, asking if he wants to leave and take a break. The cops come to see if I've woken up yet. Nurses come and check my IV bags and vitals. All the while, I am struggling to make my body listen, to wake up. Dee is back in the room, and I think Beck and Greg are too. To my horror, they are discussing the abuse I lived. I can hear Dee explaining to Axel what happened that night she came to save me, telling him how long I was forced to stay in the hospital to heal, and how much worse the injuries were then. Jesus fucking Christ. I hear Axel say when she tells him how many broken bones I had then. He starts to speak but stops short when I finally force a whisper past my lips. T. Oh, God! She cries up before rushing over to my side. I crack open my left eye and take in her face. She's a mess, mascara running down her cheeks, her eyes red-rimmed and swollen. With just the sound of my voice, she is a blubbering fool. Oh, Iz, I was so scared! Okay, I'm... okay... I look around the room and notice that it isn't just Dee, Beck, and Greg Axel was speaking to. Maddox and Cooper standing off to the side, faces set in stone. When I meet Axel's eyes, they are bright and full of compassion. Hey, princess. 
The thought takes me to join D in a fit of hysterical crying. The nurses come in shortly after and start checking all the machines, poking around my body, changing the dressing on my head and applying some ointment to my right eye. A doctor who looks like he is well past time for retirement comes in next and attempts to clear the room to discuss my injuries, but Axel puts his foot down again and refuses to budge. The fight would be futile, so I just shake my head and wait for the doctor to go over everything. Miss West, he begins looking over at Axel with worry. He must assume that he is a reason for my injuries. How are you feeling? Even though I know it's going to hurt like a bitch, I can't hold back the laugh that bubbles up. Like I was hit by a truck thrown a few feet, then run over by a bus. Well, this is no joking matter, Miss West. I understand that you had an altercation late yesterday evening. Did he just say yesterday? Um, yes, yes, sir. My ex-husband. Right. I'm going to let you go home later this afternoon. I was assured by your roommate, Miss Roberts, that you will be monitored and she will return you to the emergency room with any signs of concern. She has a list of what to watch out for. You need to keep your head dry for the next forty-eight hours. After washing your hair, dry as best as you can. Your back needs ointment applied every six hours. Keep the open wounds covered and watch for signs of infection. I've given her all the prescriptions for your home care. Antibiotics as well as some pain medication. Do you have any questions? Obviously, Grandpa doesn't specialize in bedside cheer. No, sir. Miss Roberts has already signed all of your discharge paperwork. Try to be more careful in the future, Miss West. That earns a low growl from Axel. I squeeze his hand to make sure he keeps his mouth shut. Five hours later, I'm being wheeled out to the entrance and loaded up into Axel's monster truck. Dee has already left with Beck and Greg to go get my medication filled. Maddox and Coop climb into the back and we head off, away from the disgusting smell of death. A few minutes down the road, I realize we aren't headed in the right direction of my house. Axel, where are you going? I roll my head to the side with the help of the backrest and look over at him with my one good eye. My house, he replies as calm as can be. I don't want to fight with you, Axe. Please take me home. Dee can take care of me just fine. Not taking you back there, princess. Not until I know that fucker is no threat. Take me home, Axe. Please, just take me home. Tears start to prickle against my lids. If I had the energy... I would probably be throwing my attitude all over the cab of his truck. No, that's all I get in return. Axel, take me home now. Izzy, get me now. That motherfucker walked up to your door. Walked right up. There were three trucks in the driveway, not to mention Maddox's bike right up against the walkway. He walked right up to your door like there wasn't a problem in his life. Attacked you right under our noses. He is gripping the steering wheel so tight I start to worry he might snap it right off. I will not send you back into a house that he has no fear of strolling right up to and risk him putting his hands on you again. No, not fucking happening. He looks over at me and his eyes are blazing, his nostrils are flaring, and I can see the blood pounding through his veins. He looks like a rabid beast. Never again will I allow you to be harmed when I can do something about it, so pitch your fit another time. Please. That earns me another harsh snap of his neck and death glare. No, he booms. I sigh deeply. Maddox? Yeah, girl. His grumbled response comes from behind me. Take me with you, please. He pauses for a second, and I can feel the vibes coming off Axel go from pissed to nuclear. Yeah, girl. Thanks, Mad. Fuck! Axel bites out. "'slamming his fist against the wheel. "'We will have words later, Locke. "'Other than Coop's soft laughter, "'the rest of the ride back to Axel's is past intense silence. "'Chapter 13 "'I've been at Maddox's apartment for two days now. "'When we first got here, he set me up in the guest room "'and spent the night watching stupid reality TV with me. "'He helps me keep my wounds clean and dressed "'and make sure I take my medication when needed.' Surprisingly, he is a great nurse. What I hadn't expected was late-night screaming waking me up from his room. I know he has demons, but I didn't realize they were this bad. It was almost like we have an unspoken pact not to speak of his late-night terror. Axel has been a daily guest as well. 
He isn't happy about losing control of the situation, but I'm not sure I can handle being in his space for so long. Coop and Beck left to drive back to Bakersville and check on Brandon's whereabouts. We get a call early this morning from the detectives on my case. Brandon has an alibi. His girlfriend says that he spent the weekend at her house in her bed. There isn't much more they can do since he has a witness backing up his story. I have to admit, at this point, I don't feel safe going back home, but I know my welcome is becoming an issue with Maddox. It isn't that he doesn't want me here, but that he fears my being here. I can't understand his fear. He lives in a secure apartment complex, doorman at the entrance, and a security system that would put the Pentagon to shame. His house is probably the safest place for me to be. No, his fear seems to be related to whatever demons plague him at night. Demons he doesn't want anyone to know about. We sit down for dinner on night two and I decide to ask him. Hey, Mad, can I ask you something? I ask him hesitantly. Yeah, girl, you can ask, but that doesn't mean I'm going to answer. He looks over and despite his teasing, I can see the wariness behind his eyes. I know, I just... I just want you to know I'm here if you want to talk. I hear you, you know. I know what it's like to have your nightmares chase you out of your dreams. I guess I just wanted to know if you wanted to talk about it. I keep my eyes level with him, wanting him to know that even with my problems, I can take on his issues. I want to help. I want to be there for my friend. Nothing for you to worry about, girl. Things better left alone, yeah? All right, Mad. But if you want to talk, I'm here. I pick up my fork and return to my salad. Is he? He asks. He startles me, not because I can hear the question coming, but because I don't think I've ever heard him call me my name. Maddox, I tease. What happened between you and Reed? He looks at me with concern written all over his face, sympathy for my situation and compassion for me and my pain. I don't know what makes me open my mouth, but I know that whatever demons are chasing me, his are worse. For once... I don't feel the stabbing pain that normally comes with thinking about the old Axel and Izzy. For the first time, I want to talk to someone, want to have someone else understand why I am firm on keeping him at arm's length. All right, I start, placing my fork back on the table and pushing back in my chair. How long have you known Axel? Close to ten years. I know about you. He used to talk. I just don't understand how you were the same girl he always talked about. I can't seem to understand his anger and your heartbreak. Ten years, huh? So not long after he joined. Did you know I was supposed to be by his side ten years ago? We had it all planned out, like stupid kids. We thought that nothing would ever get in the way of our stupid plans. I was seventeen when he left for basic. Still had one more year of school left, but he was coming back. I had this tiny speck of a diamond promise ring from him. So tiny you couldn't even really see it was there. But that ring was worth more to me than all the riches in the world. He left for basic and was coming back for a visit a few months later. The plan was for me to make it to graduation. Then we would have a small wedding and I would join him wherever the Marines took him. He broke those plans. Broke them and never looked back. I stopped picking at the table and look up to meet Maddox's blank stare. He broke them, he calmly asks. Yeah, never came back to me. I can feel the emotions start choking me, but I am determined not to go there. Is he, you're sure? He never came back home? He seems so confused by this. I don't know if he ever came back home. I start earning another confused frown from Maddox. Two weeks after he left, my parents were killed. Drunk driver. Still being a minor and with no other local family, I was sent to my grandparents in North Carolina. Did Reed, Axel, did Axel know this? Yes, he would have known about my parents the second he rolled back into town. Small town living means everyone is always in your business. There is no way he didn't know about their passing. Not what I mean, girl. Did he know where you were? Um, yes. I left my grandparents' address with his foster mother. I wrote him and wrote and wrote some more to the base he was supposed to be stationed at. But all the letters came back to me. June, his foster mother. She had all my contact information. It wasn't like I was hiding Maddox. His normally blank face looks so different when he allows emotion to filter through his tightly locked walls. His nose is scrunched up. Eyes are narrowed. 
and his lips are pulled tight. He looks distressed, mildly confused, and constipated all in one. Girl, there seems to be some major wires crossed between you two. He keeps his weird look. Is that all? Seems to be a little more than just some foiled plans with all this shit. Yeah, Mad, there's a lot more. He sits there silently waiting for me to continue. It feels oddly liberating to get this off my chest, knowing that I won't be judged and that someone else will understand where I am coming from. Mad, I get you're trying to be there, but this might be different with you being his friend and all. His friend, your friend. Don't see how it makes a difference who I share my cookies with at snack time. His attempt at lightening up this conversation works, earning a giggle before I shake my head and look down at my clasped hands. You know, I tried to get in contact with him. So many letters. It was ridiculous how blinded by love I was. Never once did I give up faith that he would come to me. I saw everything, even with the pain of losing my mom and dad with a little extra sparkle knowing he would come back for me. I laugh lightly, looking up and meeting his serious eyes. Never once did I give up that hope. It wasn't until almost two months later when I started panicking and worrying, with a deep sigh and a wobble in my voice. I look back up before continuing. He hadn't been gone long, so I didn't really have much cause for concern. I knew it wouldn't be easy to talk often, but I thought for sure he would call, find a way to reach out to me when he found out about my parents. God, was I stupid. So stupid. I don't realize that I have zoned out, staring off into space until Maddox coughs, clears his throat, and interrupts my mental trip down memory lane. What happened next, Izzy? I turn my head and look into his deep, dark eyes. Just look into his understanding face for a few moments before I whisper my biggest sorrow. What happened? I finally had some light brought back into my life and more motivation to find Axel. I was pregnant, Maddox. Seventeen, alone, and pregnant with a baby I loved more than anything in this world. Even with as much as I missed Axel, I was finally smiling again because I had a small part of our love growing inside of me. I was happy. Even without my parents and without Axel physically by me, I was able to feel whole. His mouth is wide open in shock, eyes large and bugging out and the wheels are turning so fast. I worry he might start flying off track. I have stunned this big man. Uh. He coughs a few times, pausing to collect his thoughts. Or maybe he is picking up the pieces of his mind I just blew all over the room. Not what he was expecting to hear, I'm sure. Greg was shocked, and he didn't even know who my Axel was then. Pregnant. He looks down at my stomach, like he's expecting me to still be pregnant twelve years later. Izzy, what happened to the baby? You sound like you wanted the pregnancy, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember seeing any babies. His tone is light, and I know he doesn't mean to cause the sharp pain that jolts through my body. I can't help the flinch that rocks me back in my seat. I feel like he slapped me, and even though I know he didn't mean it, I can't help the tears that rush to the surface. Smiling sadly at him, I continue my story. No, you didn't see any baby. I lost my little miracle when I was three months pregnant. The tears are flowing now. As much as it hurts to talk about this, I start to feel a little lighter from finally letting someone else in. Oh, girl, come here. He pushes his big body from the table and holds his arms open to me. I crawl into his lap and hold on tight, letting out the sorrow of my loss, letting him take in the pain and purging the grief from my system. We stay like that for a while. He rubs my back and becomes my anchor while I just let it out. He doesn't push, doesn't ask me any more questions. He is just there. I know in this moment that Maddox will forever be part of my family. I finally calm down, and I'm just starting to get up when he clears his throat. I look over at him, shocked by the moisture in his eyes, the unchecked sadness his face holds. Izzy, you have to be one of the strongest chicks I know. Hear me when I say this, and please don't take this the wrong way. I feel you, girl. I feel your pain. Cuts me deep, you and Reed. But you two need to talk, because I promise you, he has no clue. Not my story to tell, but girl, no clue. 
That wire I thought was crossed is more like a ball so fucked up that if you don't sit down and work it out, you might never get it unraveled. You two hurting and hurting for no reason? A shame, girl. A damn shame. Sometimes it sounds like he is talking in riddles. I don't see how this could be misconstrued. It's pretty cut and dry if you ask me. I know Axel doesn't know about our angel, but he can't play dumb about not following through with our plans and coming to me. I don't know, Mad. If there was something else at play here, he would have tried harder to find me. I'll think about it, but no promises, okay? Well, I can ask. Can't hold that shit in forever. Might have been easier when he wasn't around, but now, not going to be able to hold it in. Mad, you know, you know you can talk to me too, right? I won't push, but I know something is eating at you. And I would guess it's something big. Maddox is always so closed off. And I know that this moment of sharing my past is big for him. I just wish he would let me in. Let me help him. Know that, girl. One day. But that day isn't today. Won't be tomorrow, but maybe one day. And that is that. I go to bed that night feeling lighter than I have in years. Dr. Maxwell was onto something when she told me to open up and let people in. All these years, I was afraid to let my guard down. And one big bad ex-marine finally let me feel close to normal again. I sleep for the first time in years without dreams. An almost peaceful sleep full of promise. Until Maddox's terrifying screams wake me up a few hours later. The next morning I'm making breakfast for both of us when a sharp knock sounds at the door. Maddox is still sleeping. I heard him screaming out a few times throughout the night. Whatever haunts him was doing a bang-up job last night. My heart hurts for my friend. Glancing over the clock above the stove, I note the time. Seven o'clock a.m. Too early for normal company. I have to remind myself that this isn't my place, and it probably is wise for me to go wake up mad. After all, I am here for a reason. The knocking continues, so I go up to the door and check the peephole. I jump back like the door bit me when I see who was on the other side. Axel. Just who I don't want to see bright and early in the morning. Well, I didn't want to see him. But a small part of me is jumping up and down like some stupid cheerleader just by seeing his handsome face. Hold on, hold on, I mutter under my breath, while I disarm the security system and throw open the door. Good morning, your assholiness. To what do I owe this esteemed pleasure? Throwing a snarky smile on my face for good measure, I look up into wide, shocked eyes. What the fuck are you wearing? He growls. Uh-oh. Looking down, I notice that I am still wearing my bedclothes, a tank top and panties which are doing a bang-up job of hiding nothing. Shit. I just woke up, Axel. What do you expect me to sleep in, a snowsuit? I expect you to not walk around naked in another man's home. Excuse me? What does it matter to you what I wear when I am sleeping? I need some serious caffeine before I can be expected to deal with this bullshit this early. Idiot. I grumble under my breath and turn to walk back into the kitchen. I take the eggs off the burner, plate the bacon, and grab the toast out of the toaster. I set up two spots at the table, effectively ignore Axel, and walk down the hall to Maddox's room. I can feel Axel burning his eyes into my back. Just to piss him off... I throw some more swing than normal into my hips. His answering groan is all I need to hear to bring a small smile over my face. Knocking softly, I call out to Maddox. Hey, you want to eat something? Wide awake and hollow, his voice calls back through the door. No. I knew he wouldn't be in a good mood this morning, but I really hoped I could help him, even by just being here. You sure? I made you breakfast. I turn the knob and peek in. Maddox is sitting on the side of his bed with his elbows braced on his knees, his head folded down into his big hands. It breaks my heart. I'm here if you need me, okay? Even if that's all I can offer, I know how important it is to have someone waiting to help carry your burdens. Yeah, girl, go eat. I'm good. He looks up at me, his dark eyes seeming to see right through me. It would seem that Maddox is still very much trapped in his head. All right, Mad. Axel is here and he is fuming at the top, but what else is new? I turn around and immediately draw back. Axel is standing directly behind me, and with no warning, 
I end up pressed tight against his hard body. We both suck in sharp pulls of air. I can feel my body instantly becoming aware of his being this close. Every single inch of my exposed skin that presses tightly to his denim and cotton-covered body is tingling. And just with this small press of our bodies, I can feel my panties become soaked in seconds. His eyes are dark with desire, and his breathing has picked up. At least I'm not alone here. He shifts closer, pressing his thick erection into my stomach. I let out another sharp gasp, not even realizing I was holding my breath this whole time. My nose fills with his hearty scent immediately. Mouth-watering. My nipples pebble and my heart is pounding. His big, strong hands reach out and grab both of my small wrists. Slowly, oh, so painfully slowly, he starts caressing his way up my arms. My skin breaking out in millions of tiny goosebumps along the way. When he reaches my shoulders, he brings his hands up, one going to the back of my neck, fingers lacing into my hair. The other travels up to the side of my face, holding my cheek and part of my neck tenderly. My body is on fire. The skin he touched is burning, and the overwhelming need to feel him has consumed my every fiber. So fucking perfect, he whispers against my lips bringing his head down the final few inches and finally crushing his lips to my own. He nibbles and bites at my lower lip, tracing the same path with his tongue to soothe the ache before taking my bottom lip between his teeth and pulling. My gasp of surprise opens my mouth long enough for his demanding tongue to work its way in. Desire is coursing through my veins. My heart is surely going to explode, and my silked panties are going to melt off my body. As our kiss continues, getting hotter by the second, he runs the hand holding my cheek down my back, his fingers gliding over the bandage on my spine before reaching my ass. With a firm hold, he pulls my body even further into his own. There isn't a single inch of my body not stuck to his. Turning my head to the side, he continues to lick and caress every solitary spot of my mouth. Our tongues are dueling together both overcome with the feelings this kiss is provoking. The hand behind my head follows the path his other hand just traveled, and when he reaches my ass, he flexes his fingers, digs both hands in, and lifts. Instinctively, I bring both my legs up and wrap them around his body, driving my core flush with his hard erection. Just what my body is craving, demanding to take what it needs. I don't realize we were moving till my back meets the cold wall, I break away from his mouth and push back a little. This does nothing but help rub my swollen pussy against his denim-covered cock. Biting back the moan, I look into his green eyes so dark and hooded with desire. We shouldn't be doing this, I weakly try to protest. I want this, God, how I want this. Right or wrong, this feels like heaven. Even chocolate is no match for the full-body electric tingles that are shooting through my system— Every hair is standing on end, and my core is clenching with anticipation of the orgasm that is just within reach. God, please don't let him take my comment seriously. He brings his face back level with mine, rubbing my painfully neglected nipples against his shirt. I dig my hands into his sides, moaning again when I feel how solid and warm his hard body feels under my fingertips. When he speaks, his words tingle my lips, reminding me of our kiss— making me groan all over and rock my pussy against his hard length. He sucks in a deep pull before speaking, his voice thick with lust. Oh, princess, I can't think of anything that we should be doing more. You feel that? You feel how fucking hard I am for you? I can feel your warm fucking cunt hugging my dick even through my goddamn pants. You are on fire for me. He brings his hips forward, rocking against me and supporting my body against the wall. We both moan my head falling back and thumping against the wall. He brings his left arm under my ass and supports me while bringing his other hand up, running it along my hips, making me gasp when he tickles my sides on his way to my swollen breast. His fingertips brush softly against the swell of my breast before pulling the tank down and under, pushing my tits up high. He lightly runs his fingers down and circles around the barbell in my nipple. I am panting now and can feel my orgasm building. When he pinches my still-tender nipples between his thumb and finger, 
I let out a soft cry, grinding down against his cock again. Still sore, he questioned, sounding like he's standing at the end of a tunnel. Hmm. Can't speak, huh, baby? Just think how good it will feel when I bury my cock deep inside that warm pussy. When I fuck you so hard, you will feel me for days. Going to make you drown in pleasure. Fuck you so good, so fucking good. He drives that home with one more rock of his hips. I close my eyes, too overcome with everything he is doing to my body to even act like I understand. His hand releases my breast, and right as I am ready to protest, I feel the warm heat of his mouth. His tongue traces the outline of my nipple, nips at the soft skin under my breast, and licks his way back up before closing his lips around my nipple and barbell, giving a hard pull. Oh, God, don't stop. Please don't fucking stop. I beg, fanatically moving against him, desperate to reach my orgasm. His fingers play against my stomach as he dances them down my torso. He splays his fingers wide and pushes his thumb hard against my clit. Soaked, fucking drenched. Can't wait to have my mouth down there licking all that wetness up. He rolls his thumb and crushes his lips back down on mine. Swallowing the cry of satisfaction, I scream out as the waves of the most powerful orgasm come crashing down on me. I feel like my whole body has just lit up, coming to life with each roll of pleasure that rockets through me. His tongue tangles with my own. This kiss is full of ecstasy. Our tongues mate together while he slowly brings me back down to earth with small rolls of his hips against my still pulsing pussy. He is reminding me that he is still very ready to continue when I feel the thickness brush against me again. Fuck, baby, you feel so good in my arms again. I look up into his eyes, trying to focus on his face long enough to make sense of his comment. The harshness I have grown accustomed to seeing mar his beautifully handsome face is gone, and in its place is pure affection. He looks like the old Axel, the one so full of love for me that nothing else matters. In that moment, I can almost believe it, almost believe that we can get back there again. And after all we just shared, I realize that I want that. I want Axel back. I want us and our love back. It has never felt like that before, not even with him. Time might not have been on our side the last few years, but right now I can almost hope that fate has decided to love me and give me some happiness for a change. What are we doing, Axel? I ask, tightening my arms around his neck and bringing my forehead down to his chest. What are we doing? I have no answers myself, but I hope he doesn't look at this as a mistake that might just kill me. I don't know, princess. I don't know but it feels way too fucking good to ignore. He brings his hands back up to either side of my face and pulls me up to look at him. We got some shit to figure out, Izzy. But after this, I won't let you go until we figure it out. Not happening. Do you feel it? Every single thing we ever felt for each other. It is still there, Izzy, and I won't let you push me away. We walked back into each other's lives for a reason. I nod my head, because really, what can I say? He's right. I just have to believe that when we sit down and bring back all those memories, he will still want to hold me so tight. Okay, Axel, you're right. We do need to talk. The white flags are waved. I bring my head back down and rest against his chest. His heart is pounding rapidly against my ear, and his scent, which is now mixed with my arousal, is invading my senses. I bring my arms up, wrap them around his torso, and pull tight. He sighs softly, adjusting my body so that he can pull me closer and just enjoy the moment of our hearts being together again. Peace. Even with the fear of telling him everything, my soul is at peace. A deep throat clearing brings me back to earth. I lean up, look over Axel's shoulder, and meet Maddox's laughing eyes. It's such a rare sight that I am momentarily speechless. He looks so different when he allows his emotions to come out, youthful and approachable, completely different than his normal hard, cold staring. Interesting. Live porn. Think you could at least take this reunion behind closed doors? Or maybe your own fucking house? His eyes might have been laughing with me, but his question to Axel was full of unspoken warning. It looks like I've earned myself another big bad brother. Sorry, Mad. 
I whisper over Axel's shoulder and give him a wink. Sorry, fuck that shit, Izzy. Axel lets my feet fall to the floor and holds on to my hips to make sure I have my balance before he gets ready to address Maddox. He leans down and, with a growly whisper, says, Don't you move, Izzy. I won't have Locke looking at you half-naked with that just-fucked glow about you. Damn. Mm. I can't wait to be deep inside you. I get one chaste kiss before he gives me his back and makes sure his big body is completely covering me before addressing Maddox. My bad, brother. I won't apologize that it happened. Hell fucking no. Best breakfast I've ever had. His laughter is vibrating his body. I dig my hands into his shirt and push my heated face into his back. How embarrassing. Funny, just hilarious. Fucking shit, I need to get laid. Asshole. Maddox walks past us and into the kitchen. He's wearing some worn sweats which are hanging low on his hips. It's a good thing I don't have the hots for him, because this view of him scratching his ass while searching the fridge is not his best look. Classy, Mad. I call over to him, unable to keep my giggles in. You shouldn't have any troubles with the ladies if you keep digging in your ass. I'm laughing harder now, feeling like the weight that was pushing down on my body is almost gone. Axel turns around, gives me a small smile, and wraps me in his arms again, lifting me off the floor so he can easily whisper in my ear. Miss that sound so fucking much. His lips kiss a line from my shoulder to my ear. His tongue comes out and licks along the shell, causing me to shiver in his arms and moan his name. You two need to either get the fuck out or get behind closed doors. Don't need to be seeing that shit this goddamn early. Go reunite somewhere else. Serious as fuck right now. I get it, and I will only say this once. About fucking time. Maddox says matter-of-factly, like, while he butters his toast. I pull away from Axel and just look into his eyes. I notice the adoration that still shines bright. I hope I'm giving him just a small sign of what I'm feeling when I smile up at him. Maddox was right last night. I can't hold it in any more. And when I have Axel back in my arms, the uncertainty isn't as terrifying. With everything else that is a mess right now in my life, I feel like this is one thing I might be ready to deal with and move on from. Hopefully I'm making the right decision here. But I can't hold on to the past anymore. I can't hold that pain in, and more importantly... I am ready to let him in. Let him in in the hopes that we can find a way back to each other that isn't just about this sexual buzz roaring around us. Go get cleaned up, yeah? And please put some fucking clothes on. As fine as that body is, I don't want anyone else enjoying the view. Sure, Axel. I'll go get cleaned up. But I don't understand what your issues are with my clothes. Most bathing suits show a whole hell of a lot more than this. Maddox doesn't care, and he doesn't see me like that. I try to reason with him, and it might have worked if Maddox would have kept his mouth shut. Just because I'm not pushing you up against walls and humping you like a fucking animal doesn't mean I can't appreciate the view. You just haven't caught me looking. He laughs. Laughs. Between mouthfuls of his breakfast. Ugh! Pig! I yell and run off to the room I have been staying in. Izzy, get your shit packed up. I'll be back around lunch to pick you up. This fucking sleepover party bullshit is over now. You're coming home with me, got it? He yells down the hall. Ready or not, time to find some of that locked-down courage and face the facts. Axe is back, and we are about to have a make-it-or-break-it come-to-Jesus talk. For the first time in years, the thought of opening up those old wounds doesn't terrify me. Chapter 14 Fuck me. I think, as I walk out of Locke's apartment and climb into my truck. I sit there for a second, trying unsuccessfully to calm down, shifting slightly to try and ease some of the discomfort in my pants. My cock is so hard that I might have permanent indentations from my zipper. I rub my hands over my face, trying to bring my heart back to a normal speed. Fuck, I can still smell her. Her arousal still clinging to my fingers, making my cock even harder. Swear to Christ, I have never been this ready to explode. Not even when I was a horny teenager getting a fucking hard-on for every single female I looked at. Damn. Even better than I remember. Iz came alive under my fingers. Just one kiss and everything else ceased to exist. She consumed me. 
her breathy moans, her soft skin, her delicious fucking kisses, and that warm fucking pussy just begging for me to take her. It wasn't my intention when I got here to go there. Not yet, at least. I have been slowly going insane since Saturday when the ex showed up. Knowing she was hurt was one thing, but knowing I hadn't been there to protect her was enough to keep me on edge all week. I haven't gotten shit done around the office, but if Greg noticed, he didn't say anything. He was just as worried about Izzy, but his had the added fear that he still didn't have her whole friendship back. I know they talked before the game Saturday, but they haven't since, with the exception of a few calls to check in. He might be having a hard time not being able to protect her, too. I don't fucking know. I haven't asked, but I do know one thing. Even if they are best fucking friends, exchanging friendship necklaces and shit, he won't be the one in charge of protecting my Izzy anymore. I have been struggling with the desire still very much there between us for a few months now. Even when I'm not in her presence, I know she is there, just within reach, and I have finally come to the realization that I'm not ready to let her go. Not again. And if I'm being totally honest with myself, I haven't ever gotten over the fact that she was and always will be it for me. I don't have any delusions. We have a lot of shit to work out, but I am ready to fight, and not just fight for us, but fight anyone, including that piece of shit ex-husband. Shaking my head, I start my truck and head off to run some errands. I need food if I expect Izzy to stay with me, and I need some condoms. There is no way, especially after that shit back at Locke's house, that we will be able to spend time alone and not end up naked. I am ready to make my girl mine again. A few hours later, I have a fully stocked fridge with more food than we will ever need and the biggest boxes of condoms I could find. Three boxes might be excessive for a normal man, but for me, that's just making sure I'm prepared. I plan on making a huge fucking dent in those boxes as soon as possible. My cock is still standing at attention, and at this point I'm starting to fear my balls might fall off. Desperate for some relief before I go back for Izzy, I climb the stairs and make my way into my bedroom, stripping as I go. Turning the water on, I step in and start cleaning my body, making a point to avoid my throbbing dick. When I finish soaping up and rinsing off, I lean my hand against the far wall and let the water rush over my tense shoulders. I wrap my hand around my cock and let out a sharp hiss. Stroking a few times, I bring my hand down and caress my balls, then guide it back up, and firmly taking hold of my cock. Only a few strokes are needed before I feel my balls pull up tight. My hand picks up speed, going from root to tip in a slow, steady, and firm rhythm. All I can picture is Izzy's face when she came this morning and with the memory of her cry of pleasure, I still my hand and let the orgasm take over my body. My abs tense with every jet of cum that shoots from my body. I rinse off again and leave the shower. I quickly dry off and throw on a pair of jeans and a black tee before setting off to claim my woman. Just thinking about whom I am going to pick up later and the night I have planned for us has my dick rearing back up and back to life. I lock the door and climb back into my truck with the anticipation and knowledge that in just a few hours, God willing, I will have her tight, hot body underneath mine again. Smile on my face, rock-hard dick in my pants, and some peace in my heart, I feel like I can take on the world and win. Time to hurry these errands up so I can get her back in my arms. Get ready, Izzy, because here I come. After Axel leaves, I'm in a complete daze. If it weren't for the buzzing still running through my body, I would have thought I'd dreamt the whole thing. Well, that and the fact that Maddox hasn't stopped smirking at me for the last hour. Cheeky little bastard. You think this is hilarious, don't you? I ask him after losing a ten-minute-long staring contest. No, girl, not hilarious. I knew this shit would happen, you two. You two have that once-in-a-lifetime type of shit that will always triumph. Try as you might. There was no avoiding that. Meant what I said last night. There was no way you two would be able to hold that back. You can forget how it was being apart from each other, but that kind of passion, it never dies. 
He turns away from me and walks off towards his room. Guess he thinks we are done here. Hey, wait a minute. What am I doing here, Mad? Am I making a huge mistake? You're always going to make mistakes in a relationship, Carl. The trick is to make sure you communicate and learn from them. The way I see it, the only issue you two have right now is communication. You need to tell him what you told me last night. He might take it well, he might not. But you have to buckle up and be ready to ride that wave when it comes. You want him? Fight for it. Be honest. That's all you can do. What if he hates me? I whisper, not making eye contact with him. Izzy, look at me. When I meet his eyes, he continues. I don't know how he will react. You can't go into this in fear. Told you last night. Both of you have your wires so fucked up. Not just crossed, they might as well be on different sides of the globe. If he doesn't take it well, call me and I'll come get you. But don't go into this with the mindset that he will hate you. Fuck, girl. You are a child. It makes sense what he is saying, but I am so scared to let Axel in again, only to lose him all over. I know without a doubt that he will be upset, but I worry he will blame me for losing our baby. All right, Mad. I promise to keep an open mind. But you better come if I need you. Any time, girl. We go our separate ways after that. Maddox gets ready and leaves to get some work done, whatever that means. I still am not exactly sure what these boys do. It doesn't take me long to pack. I don't have much here since Dia's been bringing me more as I need it. I don't think either one of us is ready to admit that I might be gone for a while. There isn't anything we can do about Brandon because of his alibi. So right now we are just watching, waiting, and praying he is done with me. I'm not stupid enough to believe that just yet. I take a shower, apply the ointment to my back the best I can, and place some bandages on the worst of the wounds. My eye is looking better. Well, better if you count than I can open it, but it has that nasty yellowish-brown color to the bruising. It is still a little swollen, but not as bad as it was three days ago. There really isn't anything I can do to fix my mess of a face, so I pull my hair back into a messy bun and finish removing all traces of myself from Maddox's guest room. Realizing I probably have quite a bit of time to kill before Axel gets back, I decide to give Maddox's house a good clean. I grab my iPhone out of my bag and hook up my earbuds. When one republic's feel again fills my ears, I can't stop the smile that takes over my face. I bet I look ridiculous just standing in the middle of Maddox's kitchen with bleach in one hand, a scrubber in the other, and a big, blinding smile on my face. Deep down inside... I hope this is another sign that fate is finally on my side. I just finish up cleaning Maddox's bathroom when I hear a knock at the door. Butterflies immediately start fluttering inside my stomach. I actually reach down and press my hand against my stomach to see if I can feel them. Laughing softly at my ridiculous actions, I put away the cleaning supplies and brush off my pants. Deep breath in. I check the peephole and see Axel's handsome face filling the viewer, he looks like he's changed his clothes and attempted to clean up a little bit. Even through the small hole, I can see the cocky smirk on his face and the bright twinkle in his emerald eyes. He looks like he stepped off the pages of some sexy cologne ad. Another deep breath in. Disarming the alarm and turning all the locks, I open the door and just look at him. My eyes travel the length of his body up to his face and back down again. His jeans are molded to his legs cupping his impressive bulge and doing nothing to hide the fact that he is literally about to burst through the zipper. I lick my lips. I don't mean to, but when his strangled moan reaches my ears, I look back up to his face. His eyes are on fire, so brilliantly bright. He clears his throat and reaches down to adjust his pants. You keep looking at me like that and we won't make it out the door, princess. I'm so turned on right now that just the sound of his gravelly voice makes me squirm. I could probably come right now. All it would take would be one brush of his skin on mine. Serious as shit right now, Izzy. You keep looking at me like I'm the last drop of water left after a long-ass drought, and I will take you right here in the doorway. Jesus Christ, I'm so fucking hard right now, I think I really could hammer nails. He sounds angry, but I'm pretty sure he's more frustrated at our current location than he is mad that I am currently eye-fucking him hard. Shit, baby, I want you so fucking bad. He whispers before pulling me into his arms. He bends down and nuzzles his nose into the crease of my neck, inhaling deep. Smells so fucking good. 
I've been wearing the same perfume for years, ever since Axel bought me my first bottle of light blue. It has been something that at times I wasn't even able to wear. But it was also something that gave me some strength with one inhale. I would remember Axel and what we shared all those years ago with just one whiff. When I feel his hot, wet tongue start tracing my collarbone before making its way up to my ear, I am once again brought to my knees with the overwhelming hunger that takes over my system. We have got to get out of Maddox's house. Now. Pushing on his shoulders reluctantly, I open my mouth to speak, but I'm halted when he brings his head up and softly presses his lips against mine. This isn't a kiss like we shared earlier. That was full of lust and pent-up rapture. This kiss is full of promise, the slow, torturing kind. He takes his time, gently stroking his tongue against my own. With one last swipe, he pulls back and looks down at me with hooded eyes. Wow, I sigh. It gets better every time. Even to my ears, I can hear the wonder in my tone. It was always passionate between us as teenagers, but never with the knowledge of an adult's sexuality. I think we both know deep down that whatever will come next will blow every single coupling we have had in the past together, and with others out of the water. As much as I would love to drag you back into that bedroom and take you now, I want time to play. If I got started here, I would only have to stop when Locke got home. I want you alone in my house, where only my ears can hear you scream. Oh, boy. Where are your bags? He questions. I just mutely point to the two bags sitting on the kitchen table. He laughs lightly before walking over and picking them up. I set the alarm and lock the door. Before I can pocket the key, Axel reaches over and takes it from my hand. You won't be needing that again, princess. I'll make sure he gets it back. He winks, pockets the key, and reaches down to lace our fingers together. I don't even remember the walk to the elevator and through the lobby or how I got into his ridiculously high truck. One second we are still standing in Maddox's living room, the next we are pulling into traffic and on the way to his house. I'm sitting here thinking about the night to come and the sound of my phone ringing interrupts my steamy thoughts. Damn. Squirming in my seat, I look down at the display and smile when I see Dee calling and her smiling face. Hey, you, I answer, looking over at Axel out of habit. I have to remind myself that he isn't Brandon, and the phone call from Dee doesn't even register on his radar. Hey, back at ya. Aren't you just a dirty little hoe bag? She sings into my ear. Jesus, I'm going to freaking kill Maddox. I don't know what you're talking about, I hedge, figuring it's best to just play dumb. Dee is going to burst over this new development. There is no telling just what she has heard either. Don't you act like you don't know what I'm talking about, Missy. I had a visit from a tall, dark, and lickable man today. You might know him. He goes by the name Axel. Called me himself bright and freaking early, and I might add that he sounded way too smug for it being before my morning coffee. Anyway, he called, asked me to wait a second before heading off to the office. He was coming by and wanted me to pack a bag. A big bag, Izzy. Now want to tell me why Axel would be calling me to ask for a big bag of your clothes? Little shit is laughing at me. She is enjoying this way too much. Yeah, yeah, like you don't already know. Let me guess, Maddox came by or something? I ask sarcastically. Maddox? Why would he come over? Seriously, Dee, you didn't talk to him? No. Axel really did call and ask me to get your stuff together. His words were something along the lines of, Me, Tarzan, taking Jane to Treehouse where she won't wear clothes and we'll play bedroom aerobics for the rest of the days. Then he took four of your biggest bags and packed almost all of your stuff up. So now, do you want to tell me what's really going on? She sounds nervous now, like she isn't sure if she did the right thing by letting him pack up my stuff. It's complicated, Dee. I'm okay. Promise. We are... we are working on things. But I will admit that four bags does sound a bit excessive. I look back over at him when I hear a deep rumble of laughter. This is not funny, I hiss at him. Baby, it is fucking hilarious. You really think that once I bury myself deep within your pussy and feel your tight walls squeezing the cum right out of my dick that I will ever want to let you go again? You must be out of your fucking mind, princess. I won't even be able to let you out of my fucking bed until we make up for every single day we have lost. He leans over and lands a smack on my lips before smiling back at the road. Oh, my God, Dee says softly into the phone. I think I just came. That was seriously hot is. 
she's not the only one who might have just had an orgasm. And if all it takes are his words to get me this turned on, I'm seriously starting to get nervous for what is to come. Chapter 15 I must have been really out of it the last time I came to his house because I don't remember anything like what I am looking at right now. His house is ridiculous. Why one man needs this much house is beyond me. Axe, I ask, looking over at the man climbing down from the big black truck. Why exactly do you need a six-bedroom house again? He has no family. It was just me back in the day. So unless he's picked up a few kids along the way, I just can't understand this. The very thought of him having a family with someone else causes my heart to tighten up in anguish. He almost looks embarrassed by the answer, and before he even speaks, it all makes sense. He had a bedroom as large as a small walk-in closet when we were in high school. To a man like Axel, this is all about feeling comfortable and knowing that he isn't that person anymore. Had enough of living in a box. I promised myself a long damn time ago that I would never have to worry about space again, or not having it. He walks over to me and pulls me into his arms. You know what it was like in June in Donnie's hole of a room. I had even less when I was enlisted. Doesn't make sense to many, but you know. I give him a squeeze, silently voicing my understanding. Right, let's go get settled before I fire up the grill and cook dinner. You're going to need your strength tonight, princess. Heat flushes through my body, and the desire to skip dinner and go straight to the bedroom cranks up to almost unbearable levels. Although, he continues... It might be nice to skip the steaks and have dessert first. Quivers of arousal shoot through my body, and if it weren't for his strong arm around me, I might melt right here on his driveway. He parks in front of the house this time instead of the garage, so when we walk inside I am met with a bright and very empty entryway. There is a large staircase right smack in the middle of a very empty room. To my left there is another empty room, and to my right there is another— there are two hallways on the sides of the staircase, but I have a feeling they lead to more emptiness. I apparently only saw a fraction of the house when I was here before. He is looking at me intently and seems to be waiting for something. It's, um, nice? Damn, of course it would come out as a question. Real convincing is. Nice, huh? Is that your way of saying you hate my house? No. I'm sure my embarrassment is all over my face. Even after all this time, I still can't lie for shit to this man. He lets out a loud laugh before slapping my ass, shaking his head and letting out some soft laughs. He bends down and picks up my bags before heading up the stairs. Come on, princess. Let's get you settled before dinner. I follow him up and up and up. When I get to the top, there are two hallways in either direction. He starts off to the left, passing a few open doors along the way. Every single room is empty except for the one I used to escape from him. Eh, how embarrassing. I hoped he wouldn't ever have to witness one of my episodes, but it seems like the more I'm around him, the more they are triggered. He walks into his bedroom and drops all the bags next to the closet. When he turns back around, I quickly jerk my eyes up to meet his, which sparkle with amusement. I was just busted checking out his very nice ass. He smirks. I blush. He winks. I lick my lips. His smile is instantly wiped from his face and a long and low groan fills the silence between us. I smirk. And just like that, he's on me. Thought I could wait, he says before picking me up and throwing me onto the mattress. Before I can even blink, he is on top of me, his large frame pressing me into the soft mattress. My legs open without hesitation and his hips meet my own, now I'm the one who's letting out a strangled moan. Thought I could get you here and enjoy some dinner without having to be inside your wet heat. Fuck, baby. I can smell you from here. I bet your pussy is soaked, fucking sopping wet and ready for me. He trails his tongue from my shoulder to my ear before taking it in his mouth and biting down. He licks the sting away and braces his body with his elbows on either side of my body. Taking both of his large hands and placing them on either side of my face... He leans down and places his lips to my ear. Can't wait, baby. I'm going to rip those tight-ass pants from your body and bury my face between your creamy thighs. I want to feel that sweet cunt around my tongue. Going to make you scream, princess. And then when you can't take it anymore, 
he pushes his denim-covered hips hard into mine, the thick erection rubbing my clit in the most delicious way. Then I'm going to lick my way up this sweet fucking body, and finally, I'm going to make you mine. He rolls his hips, and I gasp, so close. Oh, God, I pant, looking up into his bright eyes. He looks into mine, seemingly satisfied with what he sees, before bringing his lips down and devouring me. There are no other words for what he is doing with his tongue in my mouth. Our lips are moving together in a wet dance. I move my hands to his back and pull him closer to me, relishing in the feeling of his hard, tight body pressing me farther into the mattress. I can feel the bundles of corded muscles underneath my fingertips, and I am suddenly desperate to feel his skin against my own. With awkward and jerky movements, I rip his shirt up his torso, letting go of his lips long enough to pull it over his head. He lifts up and trails his fingers down my body. His rough and calloused hands pull on the soft silk of my blouse before reaching the hemline and slowly pushing it up my belly. I lean up and help him remove my blouse before reaching behind my back and ripping off my bra myself. I don't even have a second to bring my arms back around before his lips are closing around one of my tight nipples and giving a strong pull. Oh, yes, I moan, threading my hand through his hair and pulling his head closer to my breast. Feels so good, Axel. I'm so close to coming, it's embarrassing. With Axel, it has always been effortless. His answering groan against my skin causes wetness to gush from my core. As he switches to the other nipple... His hand travels back down my belly, unsnapping the button on my jeans and thrusting his hand inside the waistband. His thick finger enters me with one swift thrust, and instantly I am coming, coming so hard I swear I am floating in the air. My vision is dimming, and the scream that rips from my throat echoes through the room. He brings his head up from my chest, and with a wickedly arrogant smile he brings his hand out of my pants and licks my essence from his finger. Fuck me, baby. Not even a second, and I had that tight cunt milking my finger. I can't wait to get inside your body. Nothing tastes better than your fucking cunt. Nothing. He pulls me closer to his body and kisses me hard. My naked skin rubbing against his only makes me burn hotter. I need this man. Need him more than I have ever needed anything in my life. And if I don't have him naked soon, I might just die. He jumps off the bed and pulls his jeans off his body. He takes his boots off and pulls off his socks. He stands next to the bed, my feet brushing against his naked, hairy thighs. No shame, but then again, why would he? His huge body is ripped and hard with muscles. His tan skin, ink, and every inch of his large cock are on display for me. Taking my time, my eyes travel up from the erection pressing against his toned abs to his small, dark nipples, and then up to his heated eyes. My mouth drops open when I see the desire swirling in his hooded emerald eyes. Dreamed of this for so fucking long, is he? He makes quick work of pulling my tight jeans from my body and my drenched panties come with them. He tosses them behind his kneeling body onto the floor. He grasps my ankles and, with slow tortured movements, runs his hands up my legs. When he reaches my knees, he brings his hands underneath and throws them over his shoulders, kissing my left knee and then my right. With a small smile, he turns to run soft kisses down my left thigh, skipping my throbbing center with just the barest breath, before continuing up my right thigh with the same small kisses. His hands fall down to my hips and roughly pulls me to the edge of the bed and towards his waiting tongue. I squeak out a sharp cry of pleasure, my hands fisting the comforter and pushing my feet into his shoulders to bring my pussy closer to his mouth. He laughs, and the vibrations rip through me, causing another rush of wetness to meet his tongue. He nibbles his way around my lips, tracing every inch of my tender skin with his tongue before latching onto my swollen clit and pulling deep. I bring my hand up and press against his head, bringing him closer to my body. I can feel him bringing his hand around, but the ribbons of pure, unadulterated bliss that are firing through my system prevent me from tracking his destination— his thick finger rims the outside of my passage before thrusting inside. He gives me a few shallow thrusts before picking up speed and twisting his thick digit. Immediately my pussy clenches down hard, and I can feel another orgasm coming fast. 
Oh, my fucking God, Axel, don't stop. Please don't stop. I scream. He hooks his finger and starts to press against my G-spot, applying just enough pressure to have me shooting off like a rocket. Oh, Axel, baby, oh, God, feels so fucking good. Oh, God, never felt anything better than with you. I moan, my head thrashing back and forth against the bed. He lifts off my clit, and I look down at his face between my thighs. Princess, you need to let go of my head so I can finish eating this sweet pussy. Oh, my God, just like that, I am ready to go again. Right, I whisper huskily and reluctantly remove my fingers from his silky locks. With a wink, he is right back at it, licking every inch of my swollen pussy and every single drop of my cum before thrusting his tongue deep within me. I cry out and scream his name, the sound bouncing off the walls of his bedroom. I can't talk much more. He is slowly killing me with pleasure. Please, baby, let me love you, I gasp out. Not yet, he says against my skin, making me shiver. Give me one more. I want one more, is he? that I'm going to fuck you so hard you won't be able to walk when I'm done. He dips his head and thrusts his tongue deep within my pussy. I scream. He moans. I cry out his name. He brings his hand around my hip and presses his thumb against my clit, thrusting his tongue in and out in a steady rhythm. Axel! I yell out, coming all over his tongue before my body falls back limply against the mattress. I am just returning to earth when I feel his wicked mouth kiss the insides of my thigh, trailing soft kisses up my belly. He gives each of my painfully hard nipples a few licks and bites before continuing up to meet my lips. I hungrily kiss him back, my tongue dancing with his. I can taste myself on him and groan into his mouth at how turned on that makes me. Never would I have thought I would enjoy tasting myself on a man, but with Axel... Everything is a turn-on. His hands hook me under my arms and drag me farther back on the mattress as he settles his hard weight on top. My pussy lips open wide to hug his cock. He moans into my mouth and rocks back and forth, sliding his hard length through my wetness. Together we twist and move against each other's sweaty skin. I trail my hands down his back and grab his tight ass in both hands, pulling him closer to my body. I bring my arms up and wrap them tightly around his back and my legs around his waist. Please, Axel, I need you inside of me, I gasp against his lips. Soon, baby, so fucking soon. He pulls back from my lips and looks in my eyes. His lips are swollen from our kisses. His face is flushed and his eyes are dark with wanting. It will be over before it begins, baby. Just have to cool off. What are you so fucking bad? He crushes his mouth back down to my own and tangles his hand in my thick hair before bringing his other hand slowly down my side. He caresses my heated skin before reaching between us. He pulls his hips back slightly, giving just enough room to take himself in his hand and align his broad head to my core. Rubbing my clit a few times, he dips into my pussy only to travel back out and coat my juices around my pussy lips. He repeats this a few times while I whimper into his mouth. He groans right with me, and I know he's just as tortured with this slow process as I am. Feels so good. So wet, so hot. Can't wait to be deep inside your tight cunt, baby. He says into my neck, kissing and sucking the soft skin where my neck meets my shoulder. And with that, he gives one swift thrust and he's instantly fully inside my waiting body. I scream out. The shock of his swift entry and the tightness two years' worth of abstinence has given me bring a biting pain I wasn't prepared for. Fuck. Princess, you okay? He bites out harshly as he stills inside me. God damn, you're so tight. I nod my head that I am okay, but words escape me. Baby, I need the words. I need to know you're okay. Fine. I whisper my words trailing off when I feel him twitch inside me and I moan when the tingles of pleasure travel through my womb, causing me to clamp down on him. Shit, baby, this might be over before I move if your warm fucking walls hug my dick any tighter, he groans, bringing his lips down to mine and giving me a tender kiss. I'm okay, I gasp when he moves back slowly and inches back inside my waiting body. It's just been a long time. I'm good, so good. Please don't stop. That is all the reassuring he needs because he starts to pick up speed, 
He keeps his eyes level with mine, his gaze burning into my own. Our moans are tickling each other's lips, and our heated breaths mingle together. I dig my nails into his back and move with his body, bringing my hips up when he drives his down. We move like we haven't been apart a single day, like our bodies were made for each other. I can't help the tears that slowly roll out of my eyes. This connection, this love that is between us never died. My heart suddenly feels like it might explode. The claws of another more powerful orgasm start climbing up my spine, and I can feel his rhythm falter when I clench around him. Come on, baby, I'm going to come and I want you with me. I moan when he slams into my body, rubbing against my clit with just enough pressure to send my body into an orgasm so powerful my toes curl, my breath stalls, my eyes roll back into my head, and my skin feels like tiny needles have been injected. The most delirious orgasm I ever experience. Axel! Oh, God! Ax! I scream. I feel his grunt of completion against my neck. He thrusts a few times before bringing his hips hard against my own. I can't tell you how long we stay like that, his body molded tight against mine. His cock is still inside my body, and I am still twitching in aftershocks. I can feel his lips against my neck as I rub small circles across the wet skin of his back. With tears still falling from my eyes and the vulnerability that rushes into my system, I can't help the sob that breaks past my lips. He is immediately up, bracing his weight on his arms. His still hard cock pushes back into me, and it causes us both to groan. Baby, he questions. I shake my head, and another sob escapes. Is he... Princess, did I hurt you? He looks tortured. I shake my head again, reach up and bring my hand to the back of his neck. Tangling in the hair that curls at the end of his skull, I bring his lips down to my own, hoping to express all of the emotions flying around my body. I still love him, this man who I have thought was forever lost to me. If I am completely honest with myself, I never stopped loving him, but all this knowledge shouldn't scare me. The teenage love we shared over a decade ago has grown with such a power that it will kill me if I lose it again. I missed you so much, I sob out, gasping as the emotions overtake me. God, princess, you have no idea, no fucking idea, he says, rolling to the side and pulling me closer to his hard body. Never letting you go, is he? Never. He whispers into my hair, squeezing me a little tighter. I let him hold me while I purge myself of the overwhelming emotions our lovemaking has brought forth. I need to clean you up, baby. Don't move. He rolls up and off the bed, padding across a large room and into the bathroom. I roll over and look up at the ceiling, hugging myself tightly. I can hear the toilet flush and the water running. He walks out of the bathroom, completely unconcerned with his nudity, right up to the edge of the bed. Open up, baby, and let me clean you up. I let my legs fall to the side and watch in shocked amazement while he cleans our joint come from my pussy. The warm washcloth causes me to jerk a few times when he touches my tender skin. After a few seconds, he throws the towel in the direction of the bathroom and falls back to the mattress, pulling me into his arms again. Talk to me, Izzy. What was that? He doesn't sound mad, just confused. Sighing deeply, I reply... It was just so much, Axe, so much emotion flooding through my system at once. Never in my wildest dreams did I think we would be here again, and trust me, I dreamt of this moment plenty. I take another deep breath before continuing, looking into his questioning eyes. You have to understand, Axe, I don't know what it's been like for you all this time, but I thought you were gone, Axe, not just gone, but dead. I hiccup a sob and take a moment to collect myself. My wet eyes meet his shocked ones. I lived in hell for six long years, but those years were nothing, absolutely nothing compared with the pain I felt thinking you were dead this whole time. What? He asks so softly that I would have missed it if I weren't looking into his handsome face. I don't understand what you don't get about that, Axel. I really am confused now. He seems completely baffled. How can he think I would think any differently? He disappeared out of my life, vanished. How else would someone take that? 
baby, he chokes out. Please explain that to me. What do you mean you thought I was dead? I turn my head to the side and study him. I am beyond confused. His brow is wrinkled, his lips are pinched tight in his eyes. His eyes look pained. Can we get dressed, please? Maybe get something to eat before we have this conversation? I weakly ask him. I need to take a second and figure out what is at play right now. He shakes his head as if clearing the fog and nods. Sure, princess. We get up and he throws a tea at me from his dresser before pulling some sweats up his narrow hips. Walking over to where I'm standing, he pulls me back into his arms and holds me tight, almost too tight. I know you felt it, baby. No way it's something that fucking powerful skipped to your attention. Hear me now and understand me. We will talk, but nothing you say will change the fact that you and I are happening. I won't let you go, Izzy. Never. You're mine. You got that, princess? Do I? Can I so easily give my heart back to this man, knowing he has the power to destroy me? Yes, I can. If I walked away from him now, I might as well pull the trigger myself, because I would be dead anyway. Yeah, I understand. But Axe? What, baby? I always have been yours. You know that, don't you? And with a bright smile that reaches all the way to his beautiful eyes, he pulls me tighter and places a soft kiss to my shoulder, my neck, and my ear before whispering, Oh, yeah, baby. I know. Chapter 16 I have been standing on the back deck, watching Axel flip the steaks on the grill and enjoying the view for the last ten minutes. If I hadn't understood what motivated him to buy this large waste of space before, it is all clear now. While I look out at the vast, sparkling water his house sits on the shore of, I get it. He has a very large deck with, of course, no furniture or seating, but he does have one large, gleaming grill. There is a nice-sized, grassy patch of yard before it meets the pebbled path to the dock— and then there is a lake. There are no other houses that I can see, just woods and a lot of water. It is absolutely stunning. You almost ready to eat, babe? He asks, coming up behind me and handing me a glass of wine. I look over my shoulder and just drink him in. He is still naked from the waist up, and his sweats are riding low on his hips. The sexy V that disappears beneath the material makes my mouth water. His abs clench and he growls low in his throat. Stop, Izzy. Stop right fucking now, or I will take you right here on the fucking porch. Sorry, Axe, but you did ask if I was ready to eat, I tease. Shit. He throws his hands up and walks over to the grill. I laugh and turn back to enjoy the view while he grumbles behind me about me needing to keep my sexy fucking mouth closed. We continue in a comfortable silence while he finishes up the grilling, and I finish my reflecting— I follow his lead back into the house, plate the juicy steaks, baked potatoes, peppers, and onions, bringing them over to the bar and sit on the only pieces of furniture he owns in the kitchen, bar stools. Axel, you've got to see about getting some life in this house. Besides your bedroom, your lacking bedroom, the only things I've seen are these stools, your mammoth TV, and one recliner. I point my fork at him after taking in a piece of this delicious steak— I moan over the succulent taste that explodes in my mouth before I am able to continue. You can't buy a house this big without something to take up some space. I look up and meet his eyes after I notice the silence that follows my observations. Oops, maybe I overstepped. I mean, this isn't my house, and it really isn't my business. Blushing, I put my fork down and stare at my hands in my lap. Why are you doing that? He questions. Doing what? I hedge acting like you're ashamed for asking something, even if you are being a nosy little brat. His tone is light, teasing. I... I don't know. Can't fool me with that question bullshit either, Izzy. You forget I know you. Might have been years since I've had you, but I know you. Sighing, I look up into his eyes. He doesn't look mad, just confused. His gaze is searching. It's not something I do consciously. You have to understand, Axel. I can't turn off years of conditioning... I have lived a certain way for so long that sometimes I just kind of fall back into the old me. Well, I mean, the old me after you. I can understand that, I can. 
But what I can't understand is why you seem to be afraid of me sometimes. A lot has happened. But you know, you have to know, I would never fucking hurt you. No, you wouldn't hurt me physically. I know that. I reply as I look back down at my hands. Izzy, what do you mean by that? Did we not decide that this is happening? I get you're scared, but hear me. Really hear me. I am not going to hurt you. There isn't one goddamn thing that will tear us apart again. Lost too much time already, princess. Too much time that I should have had you right here in my arms. He reaches over and pulls me into his lap. He has one arm around my back and the other across my lap. He takes one of my hands in his own before continuing. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't miss this. Right here. I spent so much time, so much fucking time thinking you were happy. Thinking that you were better off without me. God, baby. He trails off and brings his hand up to cut my face, bringing my eyes level with his. It's killed me every day since you walked back into my life, knowing I could have done something to save you from that bastard. I'm beyond confused right now. What is he talking about? He thought I was happy? And like a bolt of lightning, it hits me. You knew where I was? I ask, and I can't stop the bite of anger that colors my tone. Not for a few years. I finally found you right after you had gotten married, he says, and the pain in his eyes is heart-stopping. What? I whisper softly. He brings his finger up and brushes it against my furrowed brow, sliding down the bridge of my nose and tracing along the line of my lips. He takes my chin in his strong hand, bringing my mouth closer to his, and places a soft kiss against me. Baby, I looked for you. Searched for you every single chance I had for almost four years. I followed every limited lead there was, but they never gave me anything to go on, not a fucking thing. I know about your mom and dad, and baby. I know that was hard, and I'm sorry I wasn't there to help you through that. But why? Why didn't you tell me where you were going? You have to know I would have come for you. This big, strong man is letting me in and letting me see the pain he has felt all these years ago. I can't stop the tears even if I wanted to. I tried, Lord, I tried. But knowing the depths he went through to track me down washes through me and breaks what little thread of sanity I have left. My temper is set on a simmer now. I had just enough time when I got back home from my leave to find out about them and that you were gone. No one knew where your grandparents lived. The best I got was that you were in some small town in the Carolinas and no one knew which one. It wasn't for lack of trying, princess. Please understand that. I just didn't have the resources or the time to track you down. It got to the point where I started to feel like if you wanted to be found, you would let me know. Hell, a breadcrumb trail. Flares, bat signal. I would have taken any of that. His attempted at humor misses the mark. I tried to take in all this new information. All these facts that I haven't once considered over the years. He wanted to find me? How is that? I left my address with June. She knew I wanted him to find me. She knew I was waiting on him. I can't stand the anger that is slowly burning through my body. That fucking bitch. June! I bark, getting off his lap and pacing around the large, empty space of his kitchen. I turn back to look at him and notice a confused look blanketing his handsome face. I rush to explain. That bitch, June! I gave her everything, Axel! Every fucking thing that you would need to find me. My grandparents' address in North Carolina, their phone numbers, and I wrote letters. So many fucking letters. When the ones to the base started coming back, I started writing them to June's house. I figured if there was any way for you to get them, it would be when you came home. Oh my God, Axe. All this time. All this fucking time. You have no clue. No fucking clue what that bitch kept from us. What she told me. My fury is a palpable thing, filling the room with its thickness and completely eclipsing the sadness that had preceded it. I am forced to stop my frantic pacing when I feel the unyielding bands of Axel's hands close around my biceps. Princess, stop, he says softly, pulling me back to his chest and closing his arms over my chest. I can't fix this if you don't tell me what has you freaked out. I pull out of his hold and turn around to look into his eyes. I have to look into his eyes be able to judge where his mind is right now. The only thing I see is confusion and maybe, hopefully, a little love. Do you have any idea how much I needed you? 
When my parents died, you were the only thing that would take that pain away. But you weren't there. I was okay with that. Please know I never would hold that against you. I rush to explain when I see the look that crosses his face. I was so proud of you, Axel. Not a day went by, even through all that pain, that I wasn't so proud of you. He reaches up and brushes the tear that leaks from my eye. I had so much going on the week after they died. I was hurting, lost, alone. I felt completely adrift, with no anchor. Graham and Pop, they were good people, and they loved me. But they lost, too, and suddenly had a depressed teenager to deal with. Sometimes I wonder if they just didn't know what to do with me, but they tried. I had a week, one week, to pack my things up and leave. Pop couldn't leave things back home for too long, and Graham didn't want to be away. She hated traveling. That's why you never met her. I walk away from him and over to the window that faces the lake, now dark with the soft glow of the moon reflecting in its rippling water. I made sure I ran by June's to bring her everything you would need. I didn't know who else to give it to. You hadn't been gone long enough to let me know how to contact you. The only thing I had was the base you were going to be stationed at. A sob tears up my throat and interrupts my retelling. I... I w w was so st stupid, I cry. I turn around to face him and find him right behind me, arms stretched wide and waiting. I rush into his hold and let my sadness flow. I let him be my rock, the rock I have needed for so long. I bring my arms around his back, pull him as close as I can get. I feel his lips against my hair, his chest rising and falling rapidly and his heart racing beneath my ear. Baby, Jesus, I wish I would have known. I wish I would have been there. You're killing me, fucking slicing me open right now. Look at me, Izzy, he says, leaving no room for argument. I look up into his pleading eyes. I would have dropped everything to save you from any ounce of pain. If it is within my reach to do that now, know that I will never fucking let pain touch your heart, baby. It kills me to know how easy it was for the world to rip us apart. For years, baby, I have spent years thinking you left me, that you chose to leave me. God! He trails off and leans down to capture my lips. This kiss is like nothing we have shared since coming back to us. This kiss is full of the sadness of what we have lost, but with the promise of what we will have. His lips make love to mine. Not one day went by, Izzy, that my heart didn't belong to you. To this day, there's only been one woman who has and will ever hold it. Fuck, baby. But the love I have for you is so fucking strong sometimes. I wonder if it will crush me. He whispers when he breaks a kiss to pull me tight against his chest. I still with his words. Love. I know how I feel about him, but the shock of hearing him say it to me is overwhelming. He can't love me, not yet. Not without knowing everything. Small panic bubbles up, but I quickly squash it. I have to be strong. I have to be strong for him, because after this, I don't know how he will feel. I press my hands against his chest and give a small shove. He looks down at me, confused that I'm pushing him away instead of pulling him closer. Or maybe the shock is because I didn't return his sentiments. Oh, if he only knew the love that burns for him. I didn't finish, Axe. You have to let me finish, I desperately say, resuming my pacing just out of his reach. I look over at him standing beside the window I left him at. He's leaned back against it, crossed arms over his chest. I can't read the emotion in his eyes. I know he's confused, but he seems almost agitated with me. God, this is so hard, I whisper to myself. I should have known his stupid empty house would aid the words into his ears. Izzy, I don't know what else there could be. I already know about him, he spits out. I stop my pacing and look back over at him. My heart is breaking all over again, remembering the night of my eighteenth birthday. I wanted it so bad, I whisper again. What? he questions, pushing off the window and walking over to me, taking my arms in his hands again and forcing me to still in my fidgeting. I choke down the nervous sob that starts up my throat, but I am helpless to clench the tears that flow lightly down my cheeks. I wanted it so bad, so fucking bad, I choke out, trying desperately to communicate my pain. 
Princess Sirius is shit right now. I have no idea what you're talking about, he says, his frustration causing him to give me a small shake. I look into his handsome face, picturing for what has to be the millionth time what our child would have looked like, unable to take the vision of angelic perfection that crosses my mind. I crash my forehead into his chest and sob, sob for everything we have unjustly lost. The baby, I cry into his chest, the baby I loved with every fiber in my body and every single ounce of love for you I had, the baby that I wasn't able to even protect from my own body. I scream hysterically into his chest. My body gives out with the amount of agony and grief that invades my mind, and I crumble to the floor before he can catch me. Emotions I have worked so hard to push back and lock away are flooding my system, causing great, big, powerful wails to escape me. No, baby, no, I hear him cry over my breakdown. I feel rather than see his body drop to the floor next to me. He wraps me tightly in his arms and begins to rock me, my cheek resting on his shoulder and my nose buried in the warm skin of his neck. I don't know how long we sit like that. It feels like hours, but it could only be minutes. He just holds me to his body, his arms and legs wrapped tightly around me. It wasn't until I feel the warm drops of his tears hitting my face that I look up to meet his eyes, eyes that must mirror my own right now. He is doing nothing to hide the evidence of his despair. Never in all the years I have known this man have I ever seen him shed one tear besides the one I felt when I was in the hospital. There are only a few tears that escape before he seems to pull himself somewhat together. His body is heaving with the effort of his control. Baby, fuck, princess. I had no clue, no fucking clue. I take his face between my hands and wipe his tears away with my thumbs. What happened? he asks. I know what he is asking. He wants to know what happened to our baby. I take a deep breath and finish what needs to be said. I had just marked the end of my first trimester when I miscarried. Three months along and I lost our baby, I whisper, keeping my eyes on him while I tell him. The doctor said there wasn't anything I could have done. It was just God's will. I shake my head and look back down, pressing my head against his strong chest. It was my birthday, I say almost as an afterthought. He stills at that. I can hear the wheels turning in his head, the pieces finally fitting together. The club. That's what Greg was talking about, wasn't it? A statement. He knows. There really isn't any question about it. Of all the days he could have walked back into my life, that was the worst. Yeah, the club, I reply. We sit there, him holding me in his arms, my legs brought in tight against my chest, and my arms thrown tightly around his body. His arms are around my neck, and his legs are stretched out on either side of my balled-up form. We sit there and silently offer the only thing we can. Each other. It's hard for me to put myself in his shoes. I don't doubt that he is feeling the heaviness of the situation, but he hasn't had any time to even process the fact that there was a baby. We would have had a child, made out of love. Even with our young hearts, we both know that any child we would have made would have been our greatest accomplishment, a joy we would have welcomed, even being babies ourselves. I bet she would have looked just like you, that round, beautiful face with the softest of skin and the palest eyes you ever saw, hair that would catch fire when she ran through the yard, laughter that would make even the surliest of bastards smile. The picture of fucking perfection, he says against my ear. The lightness in his tone does nothing to blanket the sadness. He's trying to reassure me when it should be me reassuring him. No, he would have been the spitting image of his handsome father. The strongest face we ever did see on any child. Hair so dark it would give midnight a run for its money, and eyes so green you would have sworn we robbed a jewelry store. He would have been so brave and strong just perfect, and I would have loved him just as much as I love his father, I whisper, ending on a soft catch that gives me away. We can try and lighten our sadness, but there is no getting around the fact that we both have lost and lost hard. Never again, Izzy West. I will never again let anyone take you from me, 
or anything from us. His words hang between us both as a promise and a threat. I know in this moment that this man would fight to the death to keep me by his side, protecting me from the world. I don't want to be anywhere else but here. I lean off his chest and give him the softest of kisses. It doesn't take long before we are using our desire for each other to erase the pain we still hold heavy in our hearts. Come on, princess. Let's go to bed, yeah? He helps to pull me off the floor and then, to my shock, lifts me into his arms and begins to walk through the house. I can walk, you know, I joke, leaning into his neck and inhaling his intoxicating scent. His arms tighten around me before he replies, I know, but right now I need this. Just be quiet and let me lead. I can give him that. I lean up from where my head was resting on his shoulder and look at his strong profile. This man, this incredible man I never thought I would have again, is hurting. I can tell by the clenched jaw and the focused determination in his hard lines. Rightfully so. It isn't every day a man learns that he was a father. Even if the child never made it past a much-loved fuzzy ultrasound image, an image he didn't even know existed five minutes ago, a sharp pain shoots through my heart when I think of how much he would have loved our child. We had always talked about how much we wanted children. You okay? I whisper when we hit the landing on the second floor. He ignores me for a while, and I have almost convinced myself that he didn't hear my question until he breaks the silence. No, but I will be. We will be. He stops when we reach his room and gently lowers me onto the bed. I look up and meet his sad eyes before he breaks contact and pushes his sweats down his lean hips. I sit up and pull the tea off my body and throw it to the floor seconds before he presses his weight into my body, pushing me into the mattress. Every inch of our skin from shoulders to toes is touching. I open my legs and welcome his weight, his hips sliding against my arousal. He presses his forehead to my own, his breathing fanning my lips and dancing with my own heavy pants. His hands, which are holding my head reverently, warm my cheeks. I need you, princess, he softly whispers against my lips. You have me, I reply. He lifts his hips and I help guide his heavy erection into my waiting body. He doesn't move his hands from my face or his weight from my body. His forehead comes off of mine so that he can press the most loving and tender kisses to my lips. This isn't the heavy, fast sex we had earlier. This is pure lovemaking. This is two souls that have been adrift for too long finally coming home to each other. This is healing. I bring my legs up, circling tightly around his hips. My arms curl up and around his shoulders, and I hold on tight. There is nothing fast about this moment. His breathing against my lips is coming in heavy pants, mirroring my own. He rocks against me, not breaking his slow and steady rhythm for what seems like hours. It isn't until our tears start mingling together down my cheeks that he releases my cheek with one of his hands and brings it behind my knee to hook my leg higher up his side. Oh, God! I cry as lights explode behind my eyes and my toes curl. My fingernails are digging into his shoulders, anchoring me against his powerful movements. Never going to let you go, he rasps out, punctuating each word with a hard thrust into my wet core. His pelvis is grinding against my clit in the perfect friction. I cry out once again when another orgasm hits me so close to the first. He buries his head into my neck and, with a strangled cry, empties himself into my body. We lie there, covered in sweat and connected in every way possible for the longest time. His body feels wonderful against mine. My breathing slowly returns to normal, and I feel like I am able to speak. Turning my head slightly so my lips kiss his ear, I whisper as softly as I can the words I have longed to speak to him. I love you, Axel Reed. I have loved you forever, and I will never stop. Made for me, baby. You were made for me. Don't ever leave me. Never again. I would rather die than be without you again. He tenses for the smallest of seconds before rolling our bodies so that he is taking my weight, my legs straddling his hips, and my arms still wrapped around his shoulders. 
He brings his arms up and pulls me even closer to his body. I can feel our joint orgasms leaking between us, reminding me that we are still intimately connected. You wouldn't be able to get rid of me if you tried. I lean up and look into his face, memorizing each feature before rubbing my cheek against his. It feels like my heart has been ripped from my body knowing everything that happened to you. I can't even begin to process all that we lost. This is our second chance, Izzy, and nobody is fucking it up this time. His voice is soft against my cheek. His lips are warm when he presses a soft kiss against my ear before he rolls me back over and slowly slips from my body. I cry out weakly at the loss of him. Princess, that's twice now I haven't used protection. Promise you I'm clean, but I can get you papers if you don't believe me. Is this going to be an issue? He says this lightly, but I can tell by the way he's staring at my stomach he isn't talking about anything I can catch. As much as I would love to have you carrying my baby inside you, we aren't there yet. We will be, but not until my ring is around your finger. He adds almost as an afterthought, leaving me stunned. Um, I clear my throat a few times and look back up into his smiling eyes. We're okay. I'm on the pill, I whisper. Good. Then I guess I don't need all those boxes of condoms, huh? He laughs as he walks to the bathroom and shuts the door behind him. I can't help but wonder what the hell just happened here. Was that some weird marriage proposal? No, surely not. We might have agreed to see where this goes, but marriage? I am silently freaking out when he returns to the bed and tenderly cleans me off. He throws a towel off in the direction of the bathroom, before pulling me into his arms and holding me tight. My head is resting against his chest, and I can feel his heart beating slowly under my ear. I wrap my arm around him and hook my leg over his hip, brushing a still hard dick in the process. Easy there, princess. You might want that in working function later. I laugh before I allow his warm body and steady breathing to pull me under into the most peaceful, dreamless sleep I have had in twelve years. <laughs>